evening, everyone, and welcome to the City of Muskegon City Commission meeting for October 22nd, 2013. Before we begin, I'd like to welcome Mr. George Monroe of Evanston Avenue Baptist Church forward to lead us in a brief prayer, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Mr. Monroe. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this privilege, Lord, that we can be here, Lord. I will pray for our manager and our mayor and our commissioners, Lord, that you protect them at all times, Lord. Now be with this meeting, Lord, and whatever decisions that have to be made will be the right ones. We'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. You have to be sure it's off. Thank you. May we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Hood? Here. Vice Mayor Spataro? Here. Commissioner German? Here. Commissioner Waringo? Yes. Commissioner Turnquist? Here. Commissioner Markowski? Here. Mayor Galwin? Here. Thank you. May we have the consent agenda? Approval of minutes, City Clerk. Summary request to approve minutes of the October 7th Commission Work Session meeting and the October 8th City Commission meeting. Staff recommendation, approval of the minutes. Consideration of bids for B251 Muscatawa Trail Connector Industrial Park to Port City Boulevard Engineering. Summary request. Award the construction of a bike path contract along the south side of Keating Avenue between Industrial Park and Port City Boulevard to TJM Services out of Allegan for $75,560.86 as they were the lowest responsible bidder. Staff recommendation, award the contract to TJM for $75,560.86 and incorporate it into the 2013-2014 budget. Dredging contract for Cottage Grove and Hartshorn launch ramps, public works. Summary request, award the dredging of the launch ramps at Cottage Grove and Hartshorn contract to Great Lakes for $192,714.26 and authorize the mayor and clerk to sign the contract. Great Lakes out of Muskegon was the only bidder on this project. It is further requested that the award, if granted, be conditional upon approval of the bids by MDNR. Staff recommendation, award the contract to Great Lakes. Remove, remove Board of Review member, City Clerk, summary request, to remove Georgia Struby from the Board of Review because she moved out of the City of Muskegon. Staff recommendation, approval. Thank you. Commissioners, you've heard the consent agenda as presented. Are there any items you wish to have removed for further discussion? Vice Mayor? Seeing none, I would move that uh, we approve the consent agenda as read. Second. Has been moved by the Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Waringo, to accept the consent agenda as read. Any discussion? Not roll call, please. Vice Mayor Spataro? Yes. Commissioner German? Yes. Commissioner Waringo? Yes. Commissioner Turnquist? Yes. Commissioner Markowski? Yes. Mayor Gowen? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Public hearings, please. Request for an industrial facilities exemption certificate, AFI whole drill, planning and economic development. Summary of request. Pursuant to Public Act 198 of 1974, as amended, AFI Hole Drill 1920 Port City Boulevard has requested the issuance of an industrial facilities tax exemption certificate. The total capital investment will be $476,000 in personal property and will create two jobs. This qualifies them for a tax abatement of six years under the current city policy. Staff recommendation, approval of the resolution granting an industrial facilities exemption certificate for a term of six years for personal property. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Francis. Good evening. Uh, both of the companies before us tonight are subsidiaries of Aerofoil International. <clears throat> uh, this will be their seven IFTs since 2009 between the two companies um, with over $5 million in personal property investment. Uh, both of the requests tonight are for personal property. However, there may be a, a real property expansion coming soon as well. Um, the company has met with Dwana Thompson and uh, Steve Kuchis, the the owner is here tonight. Very good. Good evening, Ms. Thompson. Is there anything you'd like to add? I met with um, Steve Kuchitz on October 3rd, and um, they have totaled between the two companies 
uh, 47 employees, and they have 46%, 46 um, Caucasian, which is 98%, total minorities, 1, 2%, 42 male, 89%, and 5 female, 11%. And they are in compliance with all their affirmative action uh, standards? Yes, correct? and they are. They, have, they, ha they do have a, an affirmative action and um, equal opportunity um, policy, and they have agreed to work with us if, we, if they need assistance with finding minorities for their applicant pool. Very good. Excuse me, Ms. Sure. How many um, women and uh, minorities did you say? Okay. They have five females, and then they have one oh. minority. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Commissioner? Um, you said one... Minority. Mm -hmm. So that makes 2%? Yes. Okay, so they're working with you on a plan for the uh, affirmative action to yes. bring that number yes. up? Yes, yes. They have a goal, but I'll let Steve kind of tell you um, a little bit about what he's done in terms of recruitment and, um, you know, the endeavors that he's, you know, tried in terms of getting minorities in, in the applicant pool. I'll let, you, I'll let you tell him. I'll let him tell you a little bit more. Steve, about you come on forward. Just give your name and your address. And uh, Steve Kuchis, I'm the owner of Arrow Foil International, and we have uh, two uh, other divisions under there: uh, AFI Machining and AFI Hole Drill. And we machine, we build tooling for the aerospace companies, the foundries that make the the castings for the aerospace companies and the land base uh, companies. And then we also do finish machined fixtures for ourselves and for other machining houses that finish machine these parts that will fit in the back of the turbine engine. And I started the company in 2004 with three employees uh, renting from uh, Charlie Link over at Inner City Dispatch on 6th Street. And we're at 47 and with these uh, two, uh, two new employees for each division that will put us to 51 people. Um, I just wanted to address the um, uh, affirmative action that we have in place. We've worked with Goodwill. We've worked with Muskegon Community College, the Career Tech Center. Uh, Goodwill went through around 500 uh, applications uh, and narrowed it down to, I think it was 50, and we could not find any people that were qualified that were minorities. Uh, we found two females, but I guess that doesn't count anymore, but um, we can't find, what we do is we, the machining that we do in-house or the tool making that we do in-house requires a higher skill level than normal. We can't just have a high school degree. We have to have someone that has some type of blueprint reading experience, some type of uh, mathematical skills. Uh, we have to have someone that can measure mics, someone that can set a fixture in a machine, indicate it in within a half a thousandths, point zero 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 five. We have to have someone that can do the offsets. And I think people like Johnson Tech kind of swallowed them all up with, uh, I'm, I mean, we just can't find them. We're getting, we're going through resumes from as far away as Traverse City, from uh, uh, Grand Rapids. Uh, when you look through our resumes in the last six months, and I'd have to say that was over 500 just into us, uh, we probably only have maybe 20 from the uh, Muskegon, City of Muskegon, or the City of Muskegon Heights. So we, we are striking out when it's coming to finding anyone with our skills needed for where we're at. I mean, we are, the effort's there. I'm working with Sonia over at Goodwill. And like I said, we tried for six months and we interviewed tons of people. We just can't find anyone. We've uh, tried in the last, in the last couple of years, we've hired three people with zero skills and tried and after 30 days, they quit. They, I, we just have had no luck. What type of uh, training and skills would you suggest? Well, I'm working with um, Muskegon Community College right now, and they're setting a class in place where they're teaching blueprint reading, uh, math skills, and uh, CNC machining skills right now. It's a one semester class. And we're going to be interviewing people that are, this is their first graduating class. 
we're going to be interviewing people that are attending that to see if we can get them to come on board. Our level ones, again, they have to have the basic math skills, uh, CNC <coughs> skills. They're eight to twelve dollars an hour, uh, I, and this is posted at community college also. Level two, when you can do all these things, is thirteen to seventeen dollars an hour, and level three is uh, eighteen to twenty-four dollars an hour. So, we have openings for all those, and we have had zero luck in the last 18 months landing anyone with those types of skills so we're working with anyone we can to try to fill those slots I also have uh, a big bid that I have with General Electric Aviation and we're our first one of these machines for AFI machining we're going to qualify our first part on for putting cooling holes in and it's supposed to lead to an 80 million dollar contract and I would need 50 machines I need to add on to the building and I one person right now can currently run two machines so I'd be at least 25 people if we're successful at doing this next month uh, it, it looks like we'll really grow we've been, our goal has always been to try to have 75 people uh, over at 1920 Port City Boulevard and we're getting closer and closer like I said uh, hopefully by the end of the year we have uh, like 52 to 55 people so I'm really proud of that uh, any other Questions, I'd be yeah. happy. Yeah, is that you offer some type of apprenticeship in your um, on the tool in the journeyman toolmaker? Yes, we do. Okay, we we are allowed part where uh, the state allows us. We have nine toolmakers with 25 38 years experience, and you need to have three toolmakers for one apprentice. We have two in the apprenticeship program right now, and we're trying to recruit another one for the tooling apprenticeship program. We're also trying to hire two new toolmakers that have experience holding tolerances of a uh, of four decimals out, uh, two tenths to five tenths. No matter how big our fixture is, because it's an aerospace or land-based part and it's critical, the six nest points that hold it, whether it's four foot apart or four inches apart, have to be within point zero 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 five, so a half a thousand. So yeah. that's why we're running in the snag. We're one of the, uh, we kind of have a, a niche as far as in the tooling and the machining area that people can't hold the tolerances that we can hold. So it's a highly skilled area. Right, right. We're, we're trying to get people properly trained mm -hmm. to fill it. I, like I said, I think Johnson Technology or General Electric is just swallowing everyone up in the area that has that stuff. It's very commendable that you're working with uh, local training agencies and uh, higher ed. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that we all have to get our head around because we're hearing this more and more each time that uh, our local industrialists are before us that you know, we have to realize that our concept of what was once manufacturing industry is no longer true you know the the day of uh, starting out on the shop floor uh, stoking furnaces and then working your way up to shop foreman are gone uh, you know it's no longer your daddy's Oldsmobile as the old saying goes and Steve we can't even find people that can set the cutter height for our end mills and the holders I mean that's how bad it is oh I mean that's a basic skill we can't find anyone that even right. can do that and, 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 we, and we hear that from folks like uh, Steve Olson from Northern uh, right. Machine and the like and continually out there um, impressing upon people the need to go on beyond their high school to get some type of at least vocational certification or academic certification you know beyond and we heard that again loud and clear this past Friday mm -hmm. at the uh, chamber breakfast where uh, for the heads of our major industries in uh, manufacturing uh, were telling the same story well it's an unfortunate thing and I, I Tom Martin's helping uh, address that at the Muskegon Community College level and and uh, there's a there's a whole team of people that are doing that right now up there and I think that's our, our hopefully that's going to come through for us that's the only way we're going to be able to grow right Commissioner the anticipated jobs uh, to be added on are they uh, skilled jobs or entry level no they're high skill I they're high thinking, skill yeah. well, it has to be a minimum level too it's going to be a difficult Ex for extremely yeah they're okay. gonna have, these machines have to hold two tenths that we're doing for machining these holes accurately and they're gonna have to load brass electrodes that are two foot long and then they're gonna have to be able to go in there and set power settings and these EDM machines and these machines are three hundred thousand dollar machines I, it just uh, it's very very highly skilled uh, even with our engineers writing program we still need the operators to do offsets and to change powers so it's highly skilled. <laughs> 
Well, it's great to see that manufacturing is alive and well in Muskegon. It can, we continue to grow even in mid amidst the uh, challenges. Thank you. So, any other questions? Yeah, just uh, how long have your business been in, um, how long have you been in business? And also, I just wanted to say, also um, at the college, uh, which I do uh, work there, I'm an employee there, yeah. um, we do have that C&C program. And I do talk to a lot of the uh, students there who's, you know, interested in a career um, in manufacturing. And um, I think that it's uh, a good step that we're also accepting the early college students and dual enrolled students that are now able to get their uh, college education while in high school. So that may be something that you can stress also um, to the college and see if there um, are students interested in that type of work. I, for sure, I'm working with them. And then I, my brother, uh, he teaches the, the gifted over at Orchard View High School and he okay. also teaches part-time at, at the community college. and. He's been recruiting for me at Orchard View, like okay. saying, who doesn't want to go to four-year college? Who wants to be a machine? I mean, it's a good paying job when right. you get to level three. I'm telling you, everyone wants to be a doctor. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. Yeah. Until they're in college for four years, that they change their mind. I just had a guy that, that uh, he's 39 years old that I just hired that was laid off from four different places closed. And he said, I'm 39 years old. I need a place where I can go. He got a four-year uh, degree for nursing, and he hated it. So yeah. he's back, and, and he's, he did some CNC. I, like I said, I, I'm trying as hard as right. I can, but I just have not had limited success. Limited success. Vice Mayor, thank you. I, I think it just bears repeating. Um, when I get asked about what are we doing for jobs in the community, and I talk about the skills gap, uh, I'm not always believed. Yeah. And I think it's on all of us up here on the dais and the people we talk with to emphasize there really is no such thing as an entry-level job anymore right. unless you're a high school kid working at a fast food place. And even then, you have a skill set there that's more than what I think a lot of us may imagine. And that a lot of these, and, and when you're talking to educators, they need to understand for that that young person to have an opportunity for a middle class income, uh, if they want to work with their hands, they need to get into an apprenticeship program. They need to get into these higher skills that are the new entry level for manufacturing. And in order to do that, you have to have strong math skills. It's amazing to me the number of people who don't understand the importance of math to do basic work and that you also need to be able to have good reading skills because you can't read the instructions to do the CNC programming unless you have good reading skills and comprehension. And so I, I really think it's on us, not just the manufacturers who are struggling <laughs> to fill vacancies, uh, but it's on us to tell young people and to educators and to parents, you need to emphasize these things for your kids or there's not a job out there. Um, there's a lot of work if you got the right skill sets, but if you don't, there's there's nowhere for you to go. Those jobs just don't exist anymore. So I really see that as a challenge on us and the educational community and the parents in this community as much as it is on the manufacturers in this community. So, um, thanks. Okay, thank there, people can make a great living being a level two, level three machinist. And I have overtime, of, of, it's just crazy right now as far as the overtime that I'm paying this year. I think I'm going to have $1.5 million in overtime. So the guys that are only making $14 an hour are going to be making fifty or $60,000 too. So I'm just, I even have two criminal justice guys with two year degrees or uh, they went to school for two years to be a criminal justice, to be a police officer. They quit, they got into manufacturing. I'm, and like I said, I, I'm getting people wherever I can get them right now, someone that's got some math skills and some common sense, because remember these EDM equipment for AFI hole drill are very expensive pieces of equipment that are five axis machines, and you have to have power settings along with the five axis. Same thing with uh, Campbell Grinder, I do five axis grinding with Campbell Grinders. We, it's, it takes almost a year to train the level twos to get up to a level three uh, to, to run our five axis machines. As far as the milling goes, I do very limited CNC milling. That's the easy jelly bean stuff. What I'm looking for is highly skilled people for either building tooling, for running five axis grinders, 
and five axis speed hole drillers and four axis sinker machines, RAM EDM units. That's what we're looking for. And, and uh, I, like I said, I've got that at community college and we're doing everything we can right now, but I, I just, I, I not, I've had limited success, success right now. Well, we appreciate that you're plugging away and uh, taking this so seriously, so. Thank you. Are there any uh, comments from the uh, public uh, regarding this issue? If not, then I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing and et cetera, et cetera. I'll move to close the public hearing. Second. And uh, how about close the public hearing and approve the resolution granting an industrial facilities exemption certificate? For AFL. For AFL holder. AFL. Okay. Um, it was moved by Commissioner Turnquist, and I'm sorry, who seconded? Commissioner German. Uh, Commissioner German, close the public hearing and approve the resolution granting an industrial facilities exemption certificate for a term of six years for personal property for AFI hole drill. Any discussion? If not, roll call please. Commissioner German? Uh, yes. Commissioner Waringo? Yes. Commissioner Turnquist? Yes. Commissioner Markowski? Yes. Mayor Gulrin? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Vice Mayor Spataro? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item B, please, under public hearing. Request for an industrial facilities exemption certificate, AFI machining, planning and economic development. Summary request. Pursuant to Public Act 198 of 1974, as amended, AFI machining, 1920, Port City Boulevard, has requested the issuance of an industrial facilities tax exemption certificate. The total capital investment will be $595,500 in personal property and will create two jobs. This qualifies them for a tax abatement of six years. Staff recommendation, approval of the resolution granting an industrial facilities exemption certificate for a term of six years for personal property. Anything to add to part B? Okay, that's the sinkers. <laughs> Commissioner. I'm just gonna throw in a random comment since I didn't chime in the last time. Um, you know, Vice Mayor mentioned that um, people don't understand the importance of math. Um, and I just want to throw out and reiterate that math isn't easy for a lot of people. I myself, it's, it's not my favorite subject. But the college and many other places in town really do offer training for people. I mean, I was able to take a class, honest to God, at MCC for basic, basic math skills as an adult. So I hadn't used them in a long time and I just wasn't comfortable. So I really want to make sure that people know that if you're going back into some of these things and wanting to know them, there are many agencies that can help you, even if you're not going for a degree, you, are, you graduated high school, any of those things. You can find the training that you need. You just have to be willing to ask someone to help you. Right. And so now your cake and your cupcakes turn out because you got the right measurement. Mm -hmm. Right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you got one question. Yes. Um, I, I did not get the answer for how long you've been in business. Oh, I'm sorry. I started with three people doing tooling only in 2004. Okay. And I started doing machining in 2006. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments from? Just a question. Just, these are two different investments with a common workforce. Yeah, we Is that three okay. different divisions there. Yeah. Yes. The forty-seven and that. That's yes. yeah. combined. Yeah, it'll be fifty-one or actually probably more like fifty-five or sixty. Or uh, Thank I'll, you. I'll be back. We have to get another. I'm trying to make a five million dollar investment in the next six months so we can get us up to one million dollars. Oh yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so if you could repeat that, because there's a lot of folks who are watching at home who couldn't hear any of that because he's not near a microphone. Okay. I'll let the expert do that. Sorry. I apologize for sure. That's all right. Yeah, what we're doing right now is our goal within three years is to be doing $20 million. In order to get there, uh, we have calculated that we have to invest three to five million dollars, at least three million in the next six months in order to get us on track. So we'll be back here. I've, I've already ordered a, uh, another piece of equipment, but it's a nine month lead time, so I don't need to come here yet for the five axis large grinder. And I will also need multiple additional speed hole drillers. So I'm looking at investing three to five million dollars in the next six months. So I'll be back. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thanks, sure. Steve. Any other questions or comments from the commission? 
Any questions or comment from the public? If not, Vice Mayor. Uh, seeing no public comment, I would move that we close the public hearing and approve the resolution granting an industrial facilities exemption certificate for a term of six years for personal property for AFI machining. Second. It's been moved by the Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Wieringo, too. Close the public hearing and approve the resolution granting an industrial facilities exemption certificate for a period of six years for personal property for AFI machining. Any further comments or questions? Matt, roll call, please. Commissioner Wieringo? Yes. Commissioner Turnquist? Yes. Commissioner Markowski? Yes. Mayor Galrin? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Vice Mayor Spataro? Yes. Commissioner German? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. And good luck, Steve. Yeah, good luck. Sure enough. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 great, it's great stuff. Uh, any other business from the uh, commission? Commissioner. I just have a couple of questions that I, to me is still not unresolved and may be wrong. I'm not looking for a big dis discussion on this. There's been uh, communication between the bike time committee and the city uh, this past year or this past week or so. And uh, I, my question there is uh, how good there is our relationship between the city and, and the bike time committee. And my second question is, I, I think the smart zone question is still on the table somewhere. We have, that's not come back to us. There was gonna be some solutions or presented there. I'm just wondering where we're at on sure. those two. Can sure, um, as I'll, first of all, I'll touch on, on the bike time um, issue. You guys probably did receive a letter from, mm -hmm. from the bike time board uh, yesterday. They emailed it out, <coughs> said that, <coughs> excuse me, their intention was to not close we, uh, Western for their Steel Horse Alley, and uh, sounds like focus some of their focus it more regionally onto their property at, um, at Hot Rod Harley. Um, since I've been here, which is which is over the last month, we've met with with their board on one occasion, and then also I've met with with Clyde on two separate occasions, kind of talking about what we can do to help you know help facilitate a, a good you know a good positive event. Um, uh, I guess I guess to clarify some things we, we didn't ask to change anything about the event from the city standpoint I think that we were comfortable with the event as it had been operating I guess and for the previous seven years but the, but the group did conduct um, some surveys and things like that at a previous um, uh, bike time event that that kind of led them to determine that some things needed to change I guess to, you know to, to make the event more I guess more successful for for the for the vendors and for the people that were visiting the the event, one of the things that they wanted to do was, and I think you guys are all up to speed on this, which was um, create some sort of a vendor showcase or a, or, a, or a vendor area. And the proposal was that they that they would like to have used the new farmers market space to do that. Uh, from a city administration standpoint, we just we couldn't commit to that. Um, we weren't we didn't I don't think we were at the point where we were saying no, but they needed to make commitments to move forward with the planning for their event now and we weren't in a position to make a commitment that they could or could not use the market facility because it hasn't even been built yet and we just don't know how it's going to operate 100 um, percent we threw out a couple alternatives one was to leave the event unchanged and 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 deal with it next year with some of the changes um, and then another alternative to use a maybe a different street and kind of um, create a vendor area someplace else um, i think that by the time we got to that point they uh, the group really had really had to make some decisions about what they were going to do to appease their vendors and um, and their sponsors and, and whatnot. I think uh, you can read in the in the letter that was sent to you um, because of the potential of losing some sponsors. It sounds like they really want to want to shrink shrink their the event footprint. I guess is what it sounds like, so that the, their costs are less and then they have to raise less money and ultimately, um, you know, could result in less. Participants may not. It may result in just as many participants just, just kind of in a different part of different part of town or a different usage for Western. But um, the gist of what you, what you guys saw in your letter was that they weren't at this point. They weren't going to request that Western be closed. Maybe that could change. We do anticipate still talking with them over the next couple of months and and working out. You know, the, I guess the details of of that. But just to clarify, the main point I want to clarify was we didn't really ask for any changes. But the, the group does have some changes that they want to see implemented. And so the changes that they're implementing are 
change are things that 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 they've chose they've decided to do um and, but we still intend to work with them and make the event as successful as as it very possibly could and i don't know that there's anybody here from bike time that could speak to that or not or if you even want to open the floor to that but that's where we are with bike time people at least since i've been here um and i intend to keep on visiting Clyde. i think he enjoyed that i stopped over there and chatted with him for a little bit about the event and i think that's helpful uh the the problem with stopping over and chatting is that um, there's not a whole lot of time for chatting because they have to make some decisions on uh, how the event's going to look, and and I, I respect that they really had to, they had to move forward with their decisions, and I absolutely you know respect that. Um, the second question you had was essentially about the smart zone. Uh, um, we're working with our attorney um, and um, their attorney on putting together an agreement that essentially outlines um, outlines what's going to take place over the next couple of years, and I think you guys have been privy to the to the to the gist of it, which was, um, I think it was $25,000 payment for each of the next two years, and then some agreements that if the casino doesn't take happen within that two year period, um, on the land either be reverted to us or there'd be a lump sum cash payment to the city. And I think the essentially what we're doing is putting that into agreement form to present to the commission. At My understanding point. on the smart zone that that was an offer that they were going to place, that, does that still require approval by this board? Uh, yeah, I would assume so. Yes, uh, I would assume so. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So, so the offer, yeah, the offer stands on a you know on a sheet of paper with those three bullet points outlined in it, and and what we're doing internally is working with our attorneys to put that into a formal agreement so that that can come to you guys for approval and, and be approved by their board by their by their people as well. And that will come back to us. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. I, I, since the issue was brought up, I. I just want to reiterate my concerns about um, the smart zone that uh, we're here because they haven't paid on the agreement that they made before and so agreements to pay us money have to be taken with a big grain of salt so I'd like to see proof that they actually have the wherewithal to make that commitment and then the second thing is is that I'd like to make sure that the title to the property is actually uh, in their possession to transfer to the city if that's part of an agreement. Um, if it's encumbered, there may be people ahead of us and their agreement to deed the property over to the city in lieu of making a payment or fulfilling the agreement may not necessarily be within their power. So uh, any agreement, I would want to make sure that those two issues are, are addressed okay. so that the, the public's uh, interest is protected. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Anything else, Commissioners? If not public comment, uh, Ms. Vicki Barogi, if you'd like to uh, take the podium, give your name and address. I'll don't, set the timer. Don't worry, I haven't moved into your city. I still reside in the <laughs> fine, uh, city of Norton Shores, but I do have a P.O. box in your community at the post office, and I've had that for about five years now. And I want to raise an issue, and I know uh, Mr. Peterson took his whirlwind tour of the city and came up with a top 10 list. I want to add a number 11 to that list um, and have it be consistency and accessibility in public parking um, with time limits put on all street parking that's either in front of a business or a government building. If I park at Subway, I have two hours in Subway that I can spend. If I park at the county building, I have two hours. And I don't even know if the start start stop times are the same. But I know along the jail, along Walton, there's still marked half hour parking there. And that's gone because everybody has to go in the back. Outside your building, there's no markings. There are cars that sit out on terrace all day long. Mm -hmm. um, those should be marked two hour parking. Uh -huh. and, or some, something you come up with, not me deciding what you come up with, but you need to decide what you come up with. Um, outside the VNS building, there's no markings. Um, the old Hages building or the VNS uh, mm -hmm. office building, Skolnick House. And also, more importantly, the post office. I've seen people struggle, elderly people from time to time, having to park on Western down towards Subway and walk. Uh, the other day a guy got out with a cane and I said, that's it, I need to come and talk to you. I think at least First Street and Western need to be marked as a time limited parking around the post office. People need to be able to access that. They need to not be able to park there all day long. Mm -hmm. And it became a more prevalent problem 
when the farmer's market construction started. I think at that time there were employees parking on that property and now there's nowhere for them to go maybe. I don't know where they're supposed to go. But uh, a couple of ideas with that, I started thinking about that. Social Security building, there's a lot of parking vacant in that property. Behind Terrace Plaza, there's a lot of vacant property there. But the on-street parking needs to be for the consumers, for the people you want to draw downtown, right. for people that want to use the post office. And there's a lot of traffic in and out of there all day long. The Splash Park, I saw women walking kids across the street and I just kind of cringe because they're small kids. Uh, they should be able to park right by the Splash Park and get out of the car and use the Splash Park. Um, and I think that's real important. So I thank you for listening to my concern, and I'm hoping that at least the post office park can get handled before winter comes and we lose some more parking because of snow. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thank you. Great you. to see you again. Are there any other members of the uh, public that would like to address the commission? What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Come on up. Give your name and address. You look familiar. Good evening. Steve Warmington, 1524 Lakeshore Drive. Um, Vicki, I found that very interesting, and I, I've been to that post office, so I was trying to figure out what kind of uh, time limit you wanted to have, because if it was 15 minutes in front of the post office, I've stood in line for longer than 15 minutes oh, in that no, post okay. office. And then if it's with the kids that are there for to go into the Splash Park, and we want them to park close, I'm can they only go to the splash park for 15 minutes or, or, or are we going to give them a half an hour if it's a half an hour at the post office then that same person with the cane may still have to be down the street so those are some of the things that we find in the city of muskegon to be difficult to handle how is that huh <laughs> listen listen i uh first of all i uh i want to welcome uh mr peterson to the city of muskegon i watched the meeting last uh two weeks ago uh, looking forward to watching Frank in his first meeting and of course he sat there and didn't say a thing so I thought he did very very well. I, uh, I, I, I do want to tell you Frank that I'm and you know you and I've had this conversation I'm extremely pleased that you're here at the city of Muskegon and I applaud our city commission for uh, uh, making that hire and in, in light of the fact that I just saw on last night's news that Kalamazoo just hired a city manager I'm extremely pleased that you jumped onto the package to come here. <laughs> because I know that perhaps you would have been looking down the road from Springfield. The reason that I'm here tonight is because uh, two weeks ago when I was watching the city commission meeting, perhaps you commissioners will all recall that there were a couple of people from a towing company that came up here to speak on the towing contract. And I was watching that meeting and I will say, uh, a, a step back for just a second and say that um, a little over three years ago was when that contract was approved by the City Commission. And as I look at the City Commission as it stands today, there were, th there were three people, Commissioner Waringo, the Mayor, and the Vice Mayor that were on the Commission at that time that approved the contract. And if you'll recall, the three of you, is that we had the contract brought to us and then the staff wanted to take it back and rebid it. And it came forward and the contract was let out to Ramos Ramos, depending on which side of the family you want to talk to, it was <laughs> Ramos or Ramos. Um, contract. I, I will remind those of you who are here is I voted against that contract. Not that I was against the Ramos family or what they were doing. I didn't like at the time the way staff handled the way that we went to that second bid thing. But anyway, while I'm watching this, I'm listening to uh, the, the gal got up and spoke about uh, that they're in the city of Muskegon and the Ramos is in the city of Muskegon. That's, that's a point. And then I listened to a gentleman get up. And I'd listen to a gentleman begin to do what was irritating me, uh, talk down about a business person, a person in our community, a person who cares. Now, I am, uh, I guess, fortunate or unfortunate that I had a vehicle that was being worked on at Ramos <laughs> at the time this was going on. Um, and um, that's not the Ramos family that I know that they were up here talking about. And I know that Commissioner Hood mentioned uh, something about how this family, from what he knew, had reached out to members of the community and helped them before. And it was funny that you said that, Commissioner Hood, because it had just been that week before when I was sitting in the office waiting for someone to come out to give me a, a, a quote on the damage that was done to a car. 
Um, by the way, Tammy, that's you I'm talking about that did the damage to the car, honey. Um, <laughs> Not going home tonight. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm going home. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, I, uh, one of the gals that was working on the phone, and I'm going to take longer than three minutes if you don't, if you don't mind, because I'm here speaking for a group of people that would like to speak for Dave, and, and that's why they asked me to speak for them. Okay. So, um, but anyway, uh, as I recall, the call was uh, from someone whose car was in storage there, and um, they didn't have insurance to get it fixed, and they wanted to know if they would, they would tow it back to their house until they got ready to get, get the money to get fixed. And uh, Dave said to uh, the gal, says, yes, certainly we will. How much should I charge him to tell, how much should I tell him to charge is what the gal that was working there said. And, uh, and, and Dave said, well, what's the bill? And he said, no, don't charge him for any of the stores because they have enough they already have to take care of. Just charge him for the one tow job, not even the towing to take it to their home. So that's the kind of family and business that these people are here in the city of Muskegon. Another thing that the gentleman mentioned was the fact that Dave works for the county sheriff's department and that was a conflict of interest. I don't know, that might be a conflict of interest if this was a contract with the county, but this is a contract with the city. And, um, you know, David was a longtime police officer. He's always been a person that cares about this community and the people that live in this community. And so he enjoys working still in law enforcement. And you have to continue to be in law, law, work in law enforcement uh, for at, at least a day a month, which is what Dave works to maintain his accreditation so that he can continue to work in law. So uh, those were two facts that I found that were disturbing to me. Um, when I went to pick up my car, I, uh, I mentioned to Dave, I, I, when we walked outside, I said, did you happen to see or hear the city commission meeting the other night? He said he had heard about it. Um, it was as though he didn't want to talk about it. Um, I don't think any of us like to hear ourselves talked about in that way, particularly when we know that that's not the, tri the business that we try to do of overcharging people and doing those types of things. So I will tell you that I asked him, what his thoughts were on it, and he shared with me what, it, what they were. And um, I would tell you that this family, uh, I know there was another gentleman that walked up here then and wanted to make sure that the city was going to complete an investigation on this, no. which I found was rather strange that somebody that lived out on Walker Street <laughs> who came here for an Elks Charity Lodge part of the meeting, the only thing he wanted was to talk about was to make sure that we investigated this, almost as perhaps as though he was the pigeon in the, in the tree that was sitting here to come up and make a comment on that. Not sure, but kind of what crossed my mind when it happened. Um, I would tell you that the Ramos family would welcome this investigation. I believe that the chief has already sent somebody out to do an investigation on this. And so I'm saying to you as a city commission, because the three of us, the three of you and myself, and we sat on this before, we know what these towing contracts are like. We know how dirty the play becomes. And yet every single one of them will tell you, don't make a dime on that contract, but they'll sit and fight each other and badmouth each other and do all the things that they do to try to get these contracts. So all I'm asking for you, the city commission, to do is the same thing that other gentlemen did. Ask for a copy of that investigation Find out what we found out, or what I believe the chief found out. Find out that this Ramos family is a good, fine family. They're an excellent business to have in our community. They're fair to people who are there. They're fair to the city of Muskegon. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Mayor. Um, Vice Mayor. One, one additional comment on that. Any, anytime there's a business contract that comes up, I think it's important for us to be fair to each of the businesses that are bidding. Um, you may have many businesses that are qualified and are good corporate citizens, but you can only award the contract to, to one or, you know, usually to just one. And that's the nature of what we have to do. So oftentimes we have to tell, I mean, look at a street contract, for example. Sometimes we get up to a, a half a dozen or more bidders. Well, only one's going to get the contract. That doesn't mean that the other ones are not good businesses or... Uh, there's anything less about them. It just means in that particular interest, they didn't present the best bid. Um, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. 
the most important thing is what our experience has been as the payor on these contracts, uh, how, how we've been treated and whether or not there is a history of problems or good service. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is this came up and so I drove down just to remind myself where the business is located and yeah uh, it's as I remember uh, it's still in the city of Muskegon because the last time I looked that stretch of Getty Street is in Ward 3 and uh, you're saying no it's north of Sherman it's a it's on the wrong side or is, are we talking about a different it's, location? There's a little leg that comes in that's Muskegon Township right there, Commissioner. Oh, if I okay. mean Vice Mayor. All right. I asked the same question because I thought the same thing. I thought it was just and the Muskegon hardware part that was in the uh, township. No, there's, a, there's just a little leg that sort of juts out. And I can testify that back when we had Warmington Beverage years ago, mm -hmm. I was in Muskegon Township and it was at, at Burton and Keating and right across the street is the city yard. So, right. I mean, there's just those okay. odd pieces. Well, I stand corrected. Yeah, there's Thank little you. odd carve outs after the uh, an annexations occurred. So anybody who never believes I ever say it, uh, thank you for correcting my mistake. <gasps> <laughs> the mayor heard it before. I am so happy it was me. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is actually off topic of the towing contract. It's actually um, to the point of public comment. Um, I wanted to note that our public comment period is just that, it's public comment. It's irregardless of your address, as long as you state your address. And I do not want to dissuade anyone from giving forth their comment, especially if it promotes civil discourse, if you have ideas, if you have legitimate complaints. Um, I don't think whether you live in the city of Norton Shores or you live on any street outside of the city of Muskegon matters, as long as you follow the rules and policies. Thank you, Brian. Nikki likes to play with us. She used to be on the North Shore City, uh, city Council. Although if she were to move in the city, that'd be a nice. We'd love to have you move into the city. <laughs> Any other members of the public that would like to address? If not, I'm going to point down here to Commissioner Hood. Going, going, gone. Commissioner. I uh, move to adjourn. Second. Been moved by Commissioner Hood. Seconded by the Vice Mayor to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any in opposition? No? Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night.